So first of all, we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 2, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So notice right here, the Apostle Paul said that the course of this world, see that? The way the system of the world is run, how it is run is by Satan himself. And that's the bottom line. Satan is the one that controls everything. Events that played out and came to pass were actually manipulated and controlled. I strongly believe in that. They have been concocted and controlled. How much deliberately by certain people that the, that the devil has used? We don't know uh, how much of a level or how much uh, deliberate plans or intentions were behind it, but there is no doubt manipulation and control through these evil ones. And the devil uses that to deceive the entire world. Everybody in the world follows this evil spirit, and I'm going to prove that conclusively in this lesson. Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the loss of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now that's very important. <coughs> the verse pointed out right here that we all, see, saved believers, in the past followed the lust of our flesh. Okay, so the devil, he, how he controls the lost world is through the lust of their flesh. And us, in time past, we were like that. But now we're saved. We're no longer the children of the devil. Right. But a lot of times, we can yield to that uh, old master, yeah. the way the devil manipulates and controls the world, if we follow the desires of our flesh. That's a huge warning. The Christian churches fell into apostasy. Because they fell into their flesh, which was systemized and manipulated and controlled by certain events that followed the lust of their flesh, all from the wicked one. That's the root source. Okay, now, here we go, okay? I'm going to cover Madame Blavatsky, Occult, Satanism, Karl Marx and Satan by Richard Warmbrandt. I'm going to cover Skull and Bones. Cecil Rhodes Roundtable, and uh, yeah, just everything, okay? So, with all Jesuit conspiracy, this is all tied together. This is way too much. Here we go, you ready? All right, I got a lot, lot to read, all right? I got a lot to read. So let's start off one by one. So Frederick uh, Widowson's book, we're going to start out here. I, uh, let's start off with World War I. Remember World War I, fresh review. Okay, when we go back here, all right, here are the events that are played out, okay? These are our historical timelines we're going to look, look at. And notice the spirit and significant events and people that all control it. You see that? So this is a very important chart. I want you to always look at this chart. That way you can see how this works, okay? These are the historical events. We go back to the past right here. All of it is seated as Satan, all right? Rome. And Revelation 2 and 3 warned about it. Even Revelation 3, Philadelphia age, God warned about it. The seed of Satan. So it came to pass. Rome is that machine the devil used. And his spirit infected all of this. And these significant events and people and elites all contributed to these events, what we have today. Okay? It's really huge. It's really huge. So I want you to look at that chart and remember. So, World War I, remember, uh, Germany was in conflict, bad relations uh, with France. And actually, Germany was not getting along with the rest of Europe itself. It's becoming like that. Because remember, the Holy Roman Empire supposedly died out uh, from after Napoleon's conquest. But Dr. Ruckman argued that, no, it's just that the name itself is gone, but the spirit is still going, and it adapted. Uh, the Catholic Church is still powerful and alive. So basically, Germany and Austria-Hungarian Empire... But mostly Germany was the key where the Holy Roman Empire was able to continue its power. How far the Luther's Reformation, right? How far away from Luther's Reformation it ended up like that. So the tensions are growing higher and higher. And this is what happened. At 1130... Uh, A.M. on the morning of June 14, 1914, just four days before Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria was assassinated at Sarajevo, the 
Vatican and the government of Serbia signed a concordat negotiated by Pacelli. So remember, Pacelli is the guy who uh, was a very, uh, Eugenio Pacelli, he is the guy who be later became Pope Pius XII, one of the most influential players in world politics. Remember from our previous discipleship, he was there at the rise of Hitler and the Second World War and the Cold War. So he is very significant, that guy. Wrote a PhD paper just on treaties of Vatican and the world nations. Genius. Now remember, these guys aren't stupid. Yeah. Remember that, okay? Devil's people are not stupid. All right? It's just our current leader right now stupid. <clears throat> okay, so. This granted the right of the Vatican to impose canon law on the Catholic subjects of this orthodox country. Okay, so go back to the past. Here we go, okay? Why is that important? Remember, Rome, uh, ever since the time of Christ, early Christianity, always remained enemy. All right? Never left. The powerful Roman Empire continued its evil spirit through two parties, the West and the East. All right? Mostly it's West. Okay? We know that because they call themselves Roman Catholics. Right? So this is a prime, more primary than this. But this is still a part of the system. So West and East, Roman Empire, Eastern uh, Roman Empire split into Eastern and Western Empires. If you recall our history, Greek Orthodox came through the East and it affected Russia. That's important to remember. West, it hit toward Europe. So that's Roman Catholicism. Now, when you see this map, you're going to notice right here what infected uh, the East area and then what the West area was doing. So, the Catholics, they, remember, they always remained the enemies of the Greek Orthodox. It was known as, I think, the Great Schism at uh, 1055 or something like that. So, this was very important because the Roman Catholic Church always saw the Greek Orthodox Church as its enemy. It never forgave, it never let things go. It wanted to, uh, the Vatican would obviously want to conquer the Greek Orthodox, pay them back, penalize them. It took centuries later for their plot to be fulfilled finally. It was during the time of the Great War era. So that's very important. So notice that the Vatican's are playing politics where they can compete against Greek Orthodox, right? So already tensions is not going very well. Relationship is not going well. Especially when France was starting to uh, get along with Russia and the Catholics, they're, they're not going to forgive that. So uh, the Godfathers is a Chick uh, Crusader comic book and it's an uh, account from uh, former Jesuit priest Alberto Rivera. Alberto Rivera claimed to have gone to deep into the Jesuit order. He quotes a cardinal and I believe his name was Augustine Bia, but I'll read him at our next discipleship class. But he learned a lot from this cardinal, and this cardinal supposedly claimed that the Greek Orthodox Church was always its enemy, so it always planned and plotted how to conquer them, win them back to the Roman Catholic Church. And because of France's relationship with Russia, their enemy, Orthodox, the Vatican won't forgive that. So the Vatican influence Germany where they can ignite World War I. So World War I was started because of the Catholic Church, actually. So that's how it's supposed to go. Rivera believes in that, and I actually believe in that, not because of Rivera's statement, though, because of a very well-documented source that, uh, from what I discover, people cannot refute, actually. It is by an unsaved believer, Avro Manhattan. So, uh, unsaved person, all right? So, this unsaved person, uh, to my knowledge, I don't think he was saved. So, this guy, he was looking at a secular perspective. He well documented everything about Vatican conspiracies. But I'll read a couple pages from Manhattan. Let me read on quickly here, okay? 
The Vatican looked upon this as a step forward in the reunion of the Latin Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, healing the schism that had taken place in 1054. Politically, this was viewed as a step toward the establishment of Serbia's long dream of Greater Serbia, uniting Slavic peoples and Croatia, as the Catholic Church was the only real stumbling block to that, uh, to that next to the power that next to the power of the Roman Catholic Empire of Austria-Hungary. The government of Austria was not pleased at the prospect of a powerful Serbia unrestricted by the opposition of the Vatican. On June 28th, a pro-Serbian agitator shot down the Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, and the Serbian Concordat became an issue of anti-Serbian rhetoric in Austria. Vatican meddling in international politics was one of the causes of the First World War. So this is from even from a historical perspective, okay? I didn't even get to conspiracies yet. The assassination toppled the power balance between Europe's two armed camps, the Triple Alliance of Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, who switched sides versus the Triple Entente of France, Russia, and Great Britain. See that? So notice right here the Orthodox being the conflict, uh, Russia, France, and Great Britain in conflict against Catholic nations, right? I said Italy. I said Austria-Hungary. I said Germany. So this is no doubt well rooted in Catholicism. Austria-Hungary was eager to expand into the Balkans and expected German support. Serbia apologized for the assassination by a Serbian national and claimed absolutely no involvement in the plot. Makes you wonder if maybe the Vatican did something, right? But anyway, that's just conjecture, all right? Austria-Hungary would not back off and declared war on Serbia on July 28, 1914. Russia mobilized against Austria. Germany declared war on Russia but began invading west through Luxembourg and Belgium, and then declared war on France while Great Britain declared war on Germany because of the invasion of Belgium while America remained confused as to whom to support. <laughs> the world was at peace and then overnight was at war. This oversimplification helped to vilify the Germany of Kaiser Wilhelm, a cousin of both the King of England and the Tsar of Russia. Oh, complicated. The American president, Woodrow Wilson, had promised to keep the U.S. out of the European war, and this seemed in keeping with the Monroe Doctrine of a hundred years before, allowing the European cousin kings to exhaust themselves. But as America had recently become a global power with global possessions by way of the Spanish-American War, and Wilson having already sent troops to Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, and Panama, it was not likely that he would refrain from sending American boys and men to Europe. William Jennings Bryan, you heard of that famous name before? His Secretary of State and a born-again Christian resigned his position in disgust over Wilson's handling of the war. So there's something fishy going on with Woodrow Wilson that Christians can smell something wrong right here with America's participation in that. When the Lusitania passenger uh, liner was to sail from New York, the German embassy passed out leaflets warning people that the ship was liable to be sunk, and many agreed that the ship was carrying munitions for the war effort in England. This was used as one excuse later for America declaring war. The World War I source book by Philip Haythorn, Haythornethwaite, so... As usual, I'm going to butcher a lot of pronunciations here, okay? So, but I'm just going to uh, ram through it because I don't have time. Says that it is difficult to figure out how many actual casualties there were in this war. Conscription, the draft, distributed deaths over a large cross-section of society as opposed to previous wars in which combat deaths affected a higher percentage of professional soldiers. Also, civilian deaths were much higher than military deaths. Whoa. A million, uh, a million civilians or more died in Turkey as a result of the massacre by Turkey or Armenian Turks, while only 325 5,000 are recorded as dying in Turkish military action. Now that's sad. Serbia lost around 45,000 troops in action, but 80,000 from disease and 650,000 civilians. Germany is thought to have lost 1.8 million dead, as did Russia with France, losing about 1.3 million 
and Britain losing about the same. America lost 50,000. Okay, so notice the, some of the things here that are kind of shady during World War I. You can't help but wonder, Catholic conspiracies involved, right? Some of the language. Or some th shady things going on in America that we disagree with. We wonder if there's something insidious behind the scenes. Absolutely. So, Avro Manhattan's book, he wrote like, wow, no, 10 different books, like 400 pages each against Vatican. <laughs> And very well documented, people don't refute that. They all aim on, they all pounce on Alberto Rivera and Jack Chick, but I don't see them pouncing really well on Avro Manhattan because it's so well documented, this man. Dr. Ruttman's church, for some of you who didn't know, Dr. Ruttman's church history book on Catholic conspiracies, you know what his main book is? Avro Manhattan. And guess what? Look, uh, you want to buy them? Go ahead, buy them. They're all out of print. You wonder why. Yeah. Even Jack Chick is not, uh, Chick Publications is not really selling all of his books anymore like they used to. I found, I researched so hard, I actually found an electronic documentation of Jack Chick and Avro Manhattan both writing in the same book. And Avro Manhattan taking the Godfathers, Chick Comic, for that book on his Catholic Conspiracies on the World War. So I have the, if you, any of you are curious, I'll show you electronic attachment of it if any of you are interested. But I had, I was like, I'm going to get all of this. And I was researching and ordering and buying. And my wife's like, we're wasting money. I'm like, it's going to go out. And the Catholics are, conspirators are all going to cover it up. And I need documentation. So, so I had to get all of it. So I was busy. I was really busy. Okay. So wow. one of his, okay, so Avro Manhattan's book. Here we go. All right. Let's see how much we're going to cover. I have to cover everything tonight. This is Catholic Church Against 20th Century by Avro Manhattan, page 154. All right. I'm documenting everything here. All right. And I'm going to fully prove that everything you hear about conspiracy theories, this will be the number one video you'll ever hear <laughs> that will cover everything of conspiracy theories rooted to satanic occultism and Roman Catholic. All right. I'm going to prove it right here and there. All right. So this is it, and they're all documented by scholars, too. I'm pulling scholastic works, all right? And I'll let you know if it's not scholastic, okay? I'll mention if it's a claim, all right, or supposedly, all right? But this is all scholastic works, okay? Or well-documented works. Here we go. All right, uh, let's see right here. This arose from the rivalry and consequent hostility, page 154, again, uh, that I mentioned, shown by the Catholic Church against the Orthodox Church, especially the Russian. Another automatic result, as this religious hostility was instilled into all Catholics, including the Germans, when it was translated into political issues, it developed into active political hostility against Orthodoxy, which to Germans was represented by Russia. That's important. Mm. See, there's no doubt Catholics instilled World War I because of the German Orthodox, uh, not German, the Greek Orthodox Church, all right? That's their enemy. Blah, 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 Okay. And the attitude thus created was in complete harmony with the expansionist policy of the Kaiser, an additional bond between Catholicism and German imperialism. This was carried to such an extent that during the Russo-Turkish War, the most Catholic Winforst declared, among other things of a like nature, that in the last resort it was a question of, quote, whether the Slav or German element should dominate the world, end of quote. The hostility against the Slav and Orthodox Russia, shown by the Catholic Party, reached such a degree that it brought a rebuke from Bishop von Ketteler, quote, for its excessive Germanic self-confidence. And you wonder why Adolf Hitler came to the scene very easily at World War II. Because it was all started from World War I, this German uh, nationalism ideology. But it was rooted with Catholicism. This was the ideology which prompted the party to call its official organ Germania, a paper which later was brought by a chamberlain of the Pope von Papen. When communism... And, okay, here we go. That's, that's the story for another time. Okay, the next one. During the quarter of a century which led to the outbreak of the First World War, the Catholic Party, with the exception of a short period of conflict with Prince uh, Brilow, was the strongest group in the German Reichstag and was the most important single ally of all the German Reich uh, chancellors from Ho Hohenlohe 
to Bethmann Hallweg, and also one of the chief supporters of German imperialism. That support was well expressed by the first leader of the party, Winthorst, when dealing with that great question of German politics regarding the attitude to be adopted toward the German army. He declared in the Reichstag, quote, I recognize that the army is the most important institution in our country, and that without it, the pillars of society would collapse, end of quote. All right, so let's see right here. This policy would not have been possible uh, without the wholehearted cooperation of the Center Party. Center Party is the Catholic Party that he's been talking about, which he led. During the First World War, they stood firm in a united front of all German political parties who were in favor of war. According to B-Men, the Center Party was one of the most vociferous supporters of a greater Germany. And they staunchly advocated the rather unchristian demand for a, quote, ruthless prosecution of the war. Now that should be evidence enough. Catholics started World War I. See that? They started all of that. They were also an important prop of the dictatorship established by the generals. The Center Party supported the most unreasonable demands of German imperialism, such as annexations in the East as well as in the West. Its leader at this period, Peter, Sp uh, Peter Spahn, Spahn, however you pronounce his name, defined the views of the party on what would be the, quote, new order in Europe. So it's kind of like new world order, see that? After the Kaiser victory, addressing the Reichstag in the spring of 1916, he said, quote, Peace aims must be power aims. We must change Germany's frontiers according to our own judgment. Belgium must remain in German hands politically, militarily, and economically, end of quote. The party went even farther. So remember, this is Catholic Party that Manhattan uh, keeps claiming and were in the forefront of the most fanatical German imperialists. The Catholic paper, Hochlan, uh, demanded the annexation of Belfort, quote, with all frontiers of Lorraine and Burgundy, end of quote. And finally, the Channel Coast. This was not all, when in 1915, von Tirpitz demanded that all merchant vessels entering the war zones should be sunk without warning by German submarines, the Catholic Party supported this most enthusiastically and declared themselves for unrestricted submarine warfare, which was sponsored by generals, industri industrialists, pan-Germans, etc. Her, uh, Hertling, the Bavarian Prime Minister and one of the leaders of the Catholic Party, was an intimate friend of von Tirpitz. Still more noteworthy, the campaign was sponsored by the Catholic hierarchy itself. Wow. Proof of this is to be found in the actions of the Cardinal of Munich, Bettinger, who mobilized the rural clergy in Bavaria and launched an ecclesiastical propaganda campaign in favor of unrestricted submarine warfare. This went so far that the, listen, this went so far that the cardinal himself went to the villages agitating among the Catholic Bavarian peasantry. In reply to many protests, the cardinal made the statement that, quote, it would be an irresponsible crime on Germany's part if she failed to wage unrestricted submarine warfare. Wow. End of quote. The German Catholic Episcopate echoed these words and followed the campaign, speaking for the leading Catholic dignitaries on the question of unrestricted submarine warfare and the violation of Belgian neutrality. Sufficient to quote Michael Fallhaber, later Cardinal Archbishop of Munich, and then a prominent army chaplain, he made the characteristic remark, quote, in my opinion, this campaign will go down in the history of military ethics as a perfect example of a just war. You don't smell Catholic conspiracies after all that documentation? The na he gave names and events of people that should be more than evidence enough. And I don't, I hardly see criticisms against this. Okay, now we see the Catholic connection, okay? So the Catholics, we see their connection. Remember the Illuminati? Fresh review, okay? Illuminati, they want to be like the Jesuits. Remember that? 
Don't forget the group, Cecil Rhodes. They want to be like the Jesuits. Remember that? I don't have to give documentations. I already gave that. Okay, so that's why I put dot, 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 dot. But now the question is, do Catholics, do Jesuit hands go as so far to penetrate through all these groups? Mm. All right. Illuminati, I don't have to give documentation. There's no doubt Jesuit hands were behind it. Uh, another book is G.B. Nicolini. He's a professor respected during the early centuries from Italy itself. Okay, so he would know Roman Catholics. His book is called The History of Jesuits. The History of Jesuits, all right? It's a classical piece that even uh, I think some universities recommended, actually. So that uh, he claimed, Roth, uh, Roth, and I gave you that quote before. You just don't remember, obviously, because I gave so many quotes. So Weishaupt Rothschild, under the Jesuit general, started the Illuminati. That's what he mentioned, okay, in that book. And that's a classical work all the way from 17 or 1800s, okay? I think it was 1800s. So Illuminati, no question. Weishaupt was trained by a Jesuit. That's a historical fact. We already explained that one, all right? Now, the Illuminati, how do they reach the group? This guy bridges it, Skull and Bones. Skull and Bones. If you heard about Skull and Bones, that's where uh, the good Christian presidents, you know, the Bushes, we all remember where they come from, right? Skull and Bones was during the time of close to the first to second Great Awakening revivals. Dr. Grady mentioned in his book how there were preachers coming out of Yale, but simultaneously at the same time, Skull and Bones was coming out. There was a preacher who warned about the Illuminati, but his son or grandson joined Skull and Bones. See, they, they infiltrated. These guys, I, I, I'm telling you, if you don't smell a fish, if you don't believe people infiltrating something, you're very naive, okay? This is real stuff. So, Skull and Bones, for some of you who don't know what's during that time period, I didn't really cover that because I want to bridge it all together here, all right? And I, don't th and I don't have time to cover Skull and Bones. But the work that I'm reading from is a guy who was fellow researcher at Hoover Institution at Stanford, all right? Uh, he studied heavily on economics and everything. His name is Anthony Sutton, okay? His book is called Skull and Bones, all right? So I'm going to be quoting from him. He says, the Illuminati connection with Skull and Bones is as follows, all right? So let me establish it one by one, and then I can prove the connection that all of them are connected, okay? Johann Herbart studied at the University of, uh, I'll just mispronounce it, Jena, and came under the influence of Johann Herder, Friedrich Schiller, and Johann Fichte, and Johann Goethe. Later in Switzerland, Herbart came into contact with Johann Pestalozzi. What is interesting about these names... And they comprise the most important influence on Herbart is that they are either known members of the Illuminati or reputed to be close to the Illuminati order. Johann Gottfried Herder was Damascus Pontifex in the Illuminato. Johann Fick, we have already noted in the previous volume, was close to the Illuminati and pushed by Goethe for the post at the University of Jena, where Johann Herbart was studying. Friedrich Schiller was known in the circle, but not reliably recorded as an Illuminati member. Johann Wolfgang uh, Goethe was avarous in the Illuminati. So that's the connection of the Illuminati and Skull and Bones, because these people's names, who uh, later came out as Skull and Bones, that I gave to you, they all uh, studied, on, they all had Illuminati connections. So he proves that Illuminati is connected to Skull and Bones. Now remember, uh, this is very interesting. Skull and Bones, you know when it was started? Skull and Bones, when it was started? But anyway, before I continue how Skull and Bones were started, recall that when Illuminati was dismissed, Adam Weishaupt said, I'm going to have my followers start their own secret societies, right? Mm -hmm. Skull and Bones supposedly started, no, actually it did start, I'm going to say it did start, right when Illuminati was disbanded by the Bavarian police. So think about it, if you're from the Illuminati, you want to start your secret society group, what's the best prospect? Skull and Bones, especially with these connections that weren't mentioned with their names. Okay, but anyway, uh, let me read on word right here. Okay, why is the Illuminati connection significant? Okay, 
So uh, these pages, uh, I had to find uh, like digital uh, attachments of this, so I cannot give page numbers. But the, the sections you can find it is why is the Illuminati connection significant in his book, as well as Illuminati connection, okay? Those are the sections you can find it out. During its time, the Illuminati had widespread and influential membership. After suppression by the Bavarian government in 1788, it was quiet for some years and then reportedly revived. The significance for this study is that the methods and objectives parallel those of the order. So when he says the order, he's talking about skull and bones. In fact, infiltration of the Illuminati into New England is known and will be the topic of a forthcoming volume. So far as education is concerned, the Illuminati objective was as follows. Quote, we must win the common people in every corner. Kind of like Jesus Christ. The common people heard him gladly, right? The, the devil knows how to win, get his following. This will be obtained chiefly by means of the schools. Schools. And by open, hearty behavior show condescension, popularity, and toleration of their prejudices, which we shall at leisure root out and dispel. Now, this is very interesting. He points out right here, the Illuminati was, uh, as he cannot decide, the president of the meeting says to him, quote, the character of being a man is the only one that is of importance. Finally, in conclusion, now listen to this, all right? This will be eye-opening to you. We can trace the foundation of three secret societies. In fact, the most influential three secret societies that we know about, which he's talking about these three, guess where they all come from? Universities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Didn't we blame the schools for the corruption of society today? It's bigger than you think. It's even to private elites. Hey, y'all listening? That's important. The Illuminati was founded at University of Ingolstadt. Remember that? The group was founded at All Souls College, Oxford University in England. Remember I mentioned that? Mm -hmm. And the order, Skull and Bones, was founded at Yale University in the United States. Now you go home and pray about that. I think there's something fishy going on. The paradox is that institutions supposedly devoted to the search for truth and freedom have given birth to institutions devoted to world enslavement. That's a big pivotal factor. Now, the group's connection. How are Skull and Bones connected to group? We see how they're connected to Illuminati through their names. But then, now what about the group? All right. This is found in his page on the British connection, okay? The British connection in the same book. Some well-read read readers may raise a question. How does the order, Skull and Bones, uh, relate to Cecil Rhodes' secret society, Milner's round table, the Illuminati, and the Jewish secret society equivalents? How do these fit into the picture? So he mentions right here, it is undoubtedly, in, undoubtedly linked to overseas groups. We are concerned here only with the core of a purely American phenomenon with German origin. Remember where the Catholics were all at? Isn't that weird, guys? This is very weird. I smell a rat here, okay? No, I mean, one of these guys bound to have bumped to one of these guys, to one of these guys, to one of these guys in universities, too. I mean, you got to realize universities, German origin influence, yeah. they, they bound to bump into each other. Mm. All right. But anyway, I digress. Let's explain the links. All right. The links is purely American phenomenon with German origin, but also the links between the order, Skull and Bones, and Britain, the round table, go through Lazard Freire's and the private merchant bankers. Notably, the British establishment was also founded at a university, Oxford University, and especially All Souls College at Oxford. The British element is called the group. The group links to the Jewish equivalent through the Rothschilds in Britain. The order in the U.S. links to the Guggenheim, Schiff, and Warburg, Warburg families. All right, uh, right here. There is an Illuminati connection. Some details are in the Esquire article. So he points out an Esquire article that points further to the Illuminati connection to uh, Skull and Bones as well. All right, so now we see how 
Skull and Bones is connected to the group through Cecil Rhodes. Now, uh, let me give something interesting here. He gives a photo, okay? A photo of these people from Skull and Bones in his book. And he mentions right here that, so the photo, it'll have a little designation. You know those uh, numbers and letters sometimes at the edge of a photo? Uh, P.231 through dash D.31. Basically, it's giving like uh, uh, the description of time and date, right? Mm -hmm. So it's supposed to mean third decade of the second period. So that's the organization when it started. He has a photo of that. Again, third decade of the second period. So Sutton asks this. So a sensible question is, where does that place the start? Presumably in Germany. The first decade of the second period would then begin in 1800, and the first period would have ended in the decade 1790 to 1800. That places us in the time frame of the elimination of Illuminati by the Bavarian elector. So you know what he basically said? The, the starting of Skull and Bones, their photo, was at the same time of the elimination of the Illuminati by the Bavarian police. Did you forget what Weishaupt said? Let me repeat it from the documentation from Grady's book, right? Did you forget that one? Dr. Grady writes right here about what I, Adam Weishaupt said. Quote for quote from Adam Weishaupt. He wrote a letter to Cato. In his letter to Cato at Weishaupt, the Illuminati said this, I have considered everything and so prepared it that if the order, Illuminati, should this day go to ruin, I shall in a year reestablish it more brilliant than ever. End of quote. He said that, quote, the great strength of our order lies in its concealment. Let it never appear in any place in its own name, but always covered by another name and another occupation. What does that mean? That means he's continuing on through skull and bones or his followers. That's what it would mean. Very strong right here. I'm giving direct quotes from these people and events, and also I'm reading from scholars themselves. So that should be very, very strong on the connection. So now we see, for a matter of fact, all right, this should be convincing enough. Uh, one more thing that I want to add is this. One more thing I want to add is Doc, uh, Alberto Rivera in Godfathers. So he believes the Illuminati became the, right, uh, became the strong arm of the Jesuits themselves. Jesuits ran the whole show and that these people followed the bidding of the Vatican. So me, I cannot go that far, but I do know this. I do know that there is no doubt that there are linkages and connections with these, all these four groups. There's no doubt about that. They're all linked. Maybe they're competing against each other. Maybe some of them uh, have elites that go through several different parties and groups because they just want power. But the point is, is that they're all connected to each other and they've instigated weird stuff that I'm going to show you later on how they uh, instigated World War I and all the things that followed and led up to World War II. Okay? Uh, I am going to give you a reading from Dr. Grady's book. So, let's cover the actual things that occurred from the group, okay? So if they're all tied and connected, we see that so far, right? This one tied to this guy, this guy tied to this guy. Th these two are somehow intermeshing with each other. They're all tied, all right? The group that gives birth to a lot of the uh, big conspiracy, big names, they're the ones who founded CFR, okay? The Council on Foreign Relations. So you hear Alex Jones and all these other guys. It's the CFR. It's the CFR and these guys that control. But they don't go through historically where it all goes back to, actually. It goes all the way back to the, the group roundtable. Back to Skull and Bones. Back to Illuminati. Back to uh, the Jesuit order under uh, Ignatius de Loyola. That's really big. So CFR is founded uh, by the group. And Dr. Grady gives some, uh, some quotes right here about, and some documentations about the group. So they took over Oxford, the Times, uh, the news media source, and Council Foreign Relations. Page 449, 
he says right here, uh, during the Institute's formative uh, meeting at a dinner party held at the Majestic Hotel in Paris on May 30th, 1919, it was, res it was resolved that the New Front organization would have two central branches, one in Great Britain and the other in the United States. Professor Carroll Quigley confirms, quote, in New York it was known as the Council on Foreign Relations and was a front for J.P. Morgan and Company in association with the very small American Round Table. Headquartered in the elegant Pratt House, donated by the Rockefeller family at 58 East uh, 68th Street in New York City, the CFR was incorporated in 1921 and released the following statement of purpose a year later. The Council on Foreign Relations aims, quote, it is simply a group of men concerned in spreading a knowledge of international relations and in particular in developing a reason American foreign policy. Oh, isn't that, uh, isn't that reassuring? Isn't that nice? <laughs> okay, so they started CFR. Now, this is from Professor Sutton, okay? Dr. Grady documents his quote here. The operational, this is very important that you want to remember. The operational history of the order can only be understood within a framework of the Hegelian dialectic process. Oh, wow. What is that? Okay, you need to know that. That is important in philosophy and arguments. Karl Marx, believe it or not, got it from there. All right? Christian liberalism, textual criticism, all comes from there, too. They use some of that. This is all rooted and tied together. And I'm going to do that, Lord willing. I don't know how much time. I'm not going to write it, okay? I don't have time. All right, but remember that, all right? Quite simply, this is the notion that conflict creates history. From this axiom, it follows that controlled, controlled conflict can create a predetermined history. Blah, 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 blah. Let's go right here. The dialectic takes this trilateral managed conflict process one step further. In Hegelian terms, an existing force, the thesis, generates a counterforce, the antithesis. Conflict between the two forces results in the forming of a synthesis. Then the process starts all over again. Thesis versus antithesis results in synthesis. The synthesis sought by the establishment is called the new world order. Without controlled conflict, this new world order will not come about. This explains why the international bankers backed the Nazis, the Soviet Union, North Korea, North Vietnam, uh, uh, against the United States. The conflict builds profits while pushing the world ever closer to one world government. The process continues today. Okay, that's very important. So Sutton is telling you something about all of these groups, how they're tied together, okay? He doesn't go as far as Jesuits, obviously. He only goes back to here, okay? We Bible believers know better. It goes right here to all the way right here, okay? And through this guy. But anyway, the point is, is that, so they use Hegelian dialectic and they use uh, uh, the synthesis where they're able to create a conflict and through creation of conflicts, they can be able to con uh, control the world. That's why wars are important. See that? That's why treaties after wars are important. Mm -hmm. If they get their hands behind it, they can control the world. Okay, evidence is the group was behind this, okay? Here we go. I think you pronounce this Versailles, right? Treaty of Versailles, is that correct? Yeah. All right, Versailles? Okay, Versailles, all right, Treaty of Versailles, all right. So let's start out with the Treaty of Versailles. And this is where uh, Germany obviously lost World War I, as you might recall. So they're writing out a treaty. But this paved the way for Adolf Hitler, okay? Why? Because bankers were involved in this process. The group, Mil the round table was involved in this process. So think about that one. But anyway, let's, here we go. This is from Carol Quigley himself. Remember, Carol Quigley is a, a historian, Georgetown historian, clever guy, and he documents the round table. So this can be found in his uh, works. Dr. Grady just quotes from Carol Quigley, okay? So I'm going to mention it. Page 584 on Dr. Grady's book. 
At all of these meetings, as at the peace conference itself, the political, this is quoted by Quigley, okay? The political leaders were assisted by groups of experts and interested persons, sometimes self-appointed. Many of these experts in the peace conference, the ones who are writing it out, were members or associates of the International Banking Fraternity. At the Paris Peace Conference, the experts numbered thousands and were organized into official staffs by most countries even before the war ended. These experts were of the greatest importance. They were formed into committees at Paris and given problem after problem, especially boundary problems, usually without any indication as to what principles should guide their decisions. The importance of these committees of experts can be seen in the fact that in every case but one where a committee of experts submitted a unanimous report, the Supreme Council accepted its recommendation and incorporated it in the treaty. So all these bankers are the ones who controlled it, the treaty. All right, but he, Gante de Saint Allaire wrote, quote, those who look for the truth elsewhere than in the official documents know that President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, whose election had been financed by the Great Bank of New York, rendered almost complete obedience to its beck and call. End of quote. William Carr notes one of the more outrageous examples of this traitorous relationship. He quotes, The power of the international bankers is well illustrated by an incident that happened during the preliminary conferences held in Paris in 1919. The negotiations tended to stray away from the policy set by the international bankers. Thereupon, Jacob Schiff of New York sent President Wilson, who was attending the Paris conferences, a 2,000-word cable. He instructed the President of the United States what to do in regard to the Palestine Mandate, German reparations, Upper Silesia, the Saar, the Danzig Corridor, and Fume. The cablegram was dated May 28, 1919. Schiff sent it in the name of the Association of the League of Free Nations. Upon receipt of the cablegram, President Wilson immediately changed the direction of the negotiations. You notice that the United States president is a puppet himself. Yeah. To these bankers that are connected to the group. All right, so the League of Nations. Now, this is very interesting, League of Nations. This is where you officially can get your United Nations, all right? It's because of the League of Nations. You know what's very interesting? We know the Antichrist has to take this over to control the world. The group did not like the League of Nations. But the Masons love the League of Nations. Now that's very interesting. The reason why the group didn't want the League of Nations is because, remember, they wanted completely their British Empire. All right? They wanted that British Empire to be in control of everything. That League of Nations, the group merely wanted it as a discussion as a discussion of foreign policies and etc. But this League of Nations seemed like it would submit England to other nations. Why is that a problem for the group? Can you guess why? Because then the, then the group yeah. can't control everybody. Exactly. Because the group controls England, England's powerful elites. So how is the group going to take charge of all the other nations if England's going to submit or share power with the other nations? So the group did not like that one. So this is documented from uh, Dr. Grady's book. Um, this is from Carol Quigley. He mentions, such a conference cannot itself govern the world. It's related to this, okay, the League of Nations. Such a conference cannot govern the world, still less those portions of mankind who cannot yet govern themselves. See that? But it can act as a symbol and organ of the human conscience, however imperfect, to which real governments of existing states can be made answerable for facts which concern the world at large. So this is from the 1918 issue of the Round Table. Remember, the Round Table is from the group. So what did they mean by that? What they mean is, is that, see, uh, why are we giving the power to people who cannot govern themselves? What's that, in, what's that indicating? We're the ones. See, we're the ones who can control. We're the ones who know. So give, doing this League of Nations, we're assuming that these nations who cannot govern themselves, who cannot control themselves, that they're the ones who can work out the peace. No, you need us. Yeah. Isn't that what, that sounds like Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ saying, you governments can't take care of yourself without me. Oh, wow. Okay. 
See, this is all satanic right here. Yeah. This, this group right here is all very satanic. Okay. So then what do they have to do? So then CFR, you notice that? It came out during the World War I era. Why? Uh, like the Catholic Church, you know how these elites survive? You adapt. You adapt so that you can find the power somewhere else. See, this is all connected. This is very, very much connected. There's no doubt. Masons, they sided with Woodrow Wilson. Quote from page 589 Grady's book, this is what the president of the Grand Orient of France mentioned. This Masonic Congress of the Allied and Neutral Nations has come at the right time. We all know the disasters of the past. Now we must build the happy city of the future. It is to undertake this truly Masonic work that we have invited you here. Thus, it is absolutely indispensable uh, to create a supranational authority whose aim will not be it will be not to suppress the causes of conflicts, but peacefully to resolve the differences between nations. Freemasonry, which labors for peace, intends to study this new organism, the League of Nations. Freemasonry will be the propaganda agent for this conception of universal peace and happiness. That, my most illustrious brethren, is our work. Let us set to it. Okay. So that should cover everything about uh, their hands involved in this, all right? The conspiracy's hands behind uh, World War I and all that occurred. Okay, now, rewind, okay. We now know about these elites that they've uh, affected these events. Let's look at these public significant events that Rome is, con notice Rome is connected to here through private means, yeah. here through public means. All right, huge. Dr. Ruckman uh, mentions in his book right here. Let's see right here. All right, but before we cover uh, Dr. Ruckman's book right here, let me cover Sigmund Freud. He's the last of the evil trinity that I got to conclude. So Sigmund Freud, uh, Frederick Widdowson in his book, A Bible Believer uh, Looks at World History, page 335, he believes that next to Darwin and Marx, Sigmund Freud completed that evil trinity that changed all of our world and society, which I fully agree. It is these three men <laughs> that changed everything. So uh, Frederick Widdowson writes about Sigmund Freud right here. Now, if one regards Darwin and Marx to be two personalities in a type of unholy trinity of ideas, the third would have to be Sigmund Freud. Freud was born in the middle of the century in 1856. He went on to become, become the father of the modern science of psychiatry. He didn't, invent, he didn't invent the idea of the conscious versus the unconscious mind, but he did make those terms household words. <laughs> he created... The ideas of the ego, superego, the id, and the power of the unconscious drives for sex, food, artistic motivation, and comfort, among other things, such as neurotic impulses as dominating our existence. In other words, we are helpless automatons driven by desires and needs over which we have little control. The unconscious mind is the source of our motivations. He literally created the practice of psychoanalysis, as it is called. He declared his denial of the Bible's literal, literal truth in a book called Moses and Monotheism. Being born a Jew and presented with the Hebrew Bible by his father with a suggestion to study the book at the age of nine, he grew to believe that Moses was really an Egyptian monotheist, engaged in a civil war with polytheists. He was not popular with either Jews or Christians by his speculations. His views began to dominate the study of the mind and of its disorders. Although mainly discounted today by the adherents of the disciplines, he helped to create his dream theory and theory of the power of the unconscious mind's control over us still have their grip. No rational psychiatrist or psychologist today would even harbor thoughts of demon possession, demonic possession or obsession as that would be a surrender to superstition in their minds and like the textual critics of today, they would relegate the statements in the Bible to allegory and mere ideas which have only a quaint relevance. The power of Freud's theories over society is enormous and can be found in every public school and almost all universities along with Darwin and Marx. All three have created a renaissance of their own reviving ancient pagan dogmas, rejecting the Bible outright. These are the three that changed our world, okay? Now, 
These three who changed our world, it's very funny, okay? Now, I want to ask you this, okay? Did you ever want, what did Dr. Uckman argue uh, how Philadelphia lost, lost it all? It's when that Bible was criticized, right? Mm -hmm. Westcott and Hort. Yeah. Dr. Uckman strongly believes in that. I strongly believe in this too. Did you notice when Westcott and Hort came out with their garbage? It's similar timing when all this other garbage happens. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know Skull and Bowls Illuminati go way back, but remember this, these guys were secretive, and, uh, were, uh, but the group is the one, the main one that permanently lasted and gave you current elites today, the big names today. It's the group, not these guys. Why can they come out more successfully? It was coincidentally after the time of Westcott and Hort. Uh, Darwin, Freud, time of Westcott and Hort. Marx, Westcott and Hort. All that evil came about because that Bible final authority was lost. Westcott and Hort, I'm going to prove to you, first of all, from Dr. Upman's book and then all the other sources, that they are born from uh, Darwinism, Marxism, and that uh, all of them are interrelated e with each other with satanic, occultic references and Catholicism. All right. Uh, I so want to do this. Let me pause. Let me see how many documentations I have to read here. I can do it. I can do it. All right. I can do it. All right. All right. I can do it. All right. If any of you need to go home, you don't hurt my feelings. All right. Go home. All right. I'm sorry if it's over the time, but I have to combine all of this together so you can understand. All right. Here we go. All right. Page 212 of Dr. Upman's History of the New Testament Church. Now, whether or not any historian believes any of this, they don't. All right. But Dr. Upman believes it. I believe it because I'm crazy to believe it. All of it is involved in the attempts of the English Revision Committee of 1881 to get rid of the authority of the King James Bible. When Westcott and Hort sat down, I don't have to explain these guys. I don't have to explain these guys. I already explained those guys all right, a long time ago. All right, let me combine it all together. When Westcott and Hort sat down firmly dedicated to the proposition of getting rid of this terrible book, they sat down in bleachers that were put together by the Jesuit priests in France, the apostate German Lutherans who had become rationalists. Okay, I already explained that a long time ago in discipleship, right? All right, so there's no doubt about that. Uh, and the accumulated followers, this is where we're adding up now, of Charles Darwin and Karl Marx, okay? So he's adding these guys too not just the Catholics. A more motley crew of garbage-headed Bible perverters has never been assembled on this earth. The German apostates were Farrar, Semler, Strauss, Ausdruck, Vader, Hupfeld, Quinnen, Herder, Roos, Vodka, Ewald, Eichhorn, Seeds, Kenyon, Lavoisse, and others followed. Darwin and Pussy and Maurice were so steeped in Marx's international socialism, they would have joined Mao Zedong's regime. There is no doubt, so he connects all these names, see, with people who respect and Marx, uh, who have Darwinian and Marxist ideologies, okay? So he connected that. There is no doubt about the stand of Westcott and Hort for Darwin against Genesis 1 through 3. There is no doubt about Hort's partiality to international socialism. He idolized the unsaved Unitarian J.F.D. Maurice and praised his political treaties on the kingdom of Christ as the greatest piece of writing in the English language. <laughs> Darwin and Marx had already left their imprints on a body of orthodox conservatives. That's why the church fell apart. Who are about to replace the Protestant text of the Reformation with the Vatican text of the Roman Catholic Church. So here we go. Dr. Upman says right here on page 217 to 218. This is the truth about what lies behind the so-called scientific Greek tests of Nussel, Allen, Metzger, and Nida, which were sold to the Bible societies of the Laodicean church. Darwinism, Marxism, Romanism, Socialism. Such was the all-star team which finished the playoffs of the Philadelphian church period. So that's why Philadelphia church lost its great awakenings and everything. It's with this culmination 
This combination of delusion, socialism, sadism, Marxism, insanity, Darwinism, and Satanism, Catholicism, and I'm going to prove you it will be Satanism, really, was hailed by leading conservative scholars in Europe and America as one of the greatest revision committees that ever met. Fooey, man. Disgusting. The combinations identified above could only produce one thing. He marked this. This is important. The greatest apostasy that ever took place in the body of Christ. That's why this is the most important historical time period that we're covering in this class. Okay? I want you to remember. Okay, now, let's tie them all together. Okay? So, there's, uh, let's tie them all together. First things first, all right? So, they're no doubt tied all with... Uh, Westcott and Horde is all tied up with... These guys with Catholicism. And then also these guys were tied to Catholicism, which gave birth to this one. Okay? Yeah. Alright, so we all understand that so far. But I'm going to prove Satanism is also involved in all of this as well. Alright. So, first things first is let's start off with uh, Westcott and Hort themselves, okay? Because they're the big, big wigs, okay? Westcott and Hort, this is from David W. Daniel's book, Did the Catholic Church Give Us the Bible? And he gives documentations right here, okay? On Mariolatry. So that's the idol worship of the Catholic Mary. All right. While visiting a small chapel with an idol of Mary holding the dead Christ, this man said this, Had I been alone, I could have knelt there for hours. You know who said that? Westcott. Yeah. Uh, uh, here's another quote. I have been persuaded for many years that Mary worship and Jesus worship have very much in common in their causes and their results. You know who said that? Hort. By the way, one of these two men from Frederick Whittleson's book, Bible Believer's Guide to World History, named his uh, wife, I think, or his family member Mary because of that, that adoration of Mary. See Maurice's new lectures. He makes a remark which I have often written and said. The danger of our church is from atheism, not Romanism. Who said that? Westcott. Here's another one. Newman certainly raises many thoughts. Anglicanism seems a poor and main thing besides great Rome. Hort said that. We dare not forsake the sacraments or God will forsake us. Oh, fooey. You know who said that? A supposedly saved Christian guy named Hort. You don't smell Catholic? You don't smell Catholic connections right here? This is very weird stuff, right? Okay. All right. Now, this is interesting. Their fascination with the occult, okay? This is for real. Page 152. In 1845, Westcott and Hort with E.W. Benson and five, uh, five others founded the Ghostly Guild for the investigation of all supernatural appearances and effects. Others call them the cock and bull club. A line from their flyer states, quote, but there are many others who believe that the beings of the unseen world may manifest themselves to us in extraordinary ways. In 1872, Westcott and Hort with J.B. Lightfoot, who later became a New Testament reviser with them, founded the Aranas Club. Two of its members will soon be involved in the forerunner of the Society for Psychical research. Okay. Westcott, Hort, and their friends all associated with occultic stuff. There is no doubt about it. All right. Now, uh, Pogo sticking through the index of the founders of psychical research by Alan Gall, 1968, reveals the following company in which our esteemed Bible revisers find themselves. You'll find these names who are friends with Westcott and Hort in Bible critical, uh, textual criticism, all right? Remember E.W. Benson? He's in there. And guess who's there too? H.B. Madame Blavatsky. Oh, wow. Founder of the Occult Theosophical Society who thinks Lucifer is a good being. Wow. Clairvoyance, control spirit, crystal gazing. Who's there? Charles Darwin and Sigmund Freud. Whoa. This is from the, in the pogo sticking through the index of the founders of psychical research by Alan Gall, 1968, all right? Whoa. Ghost Club by F.J. Hort himself. Levitation by J.B. Lightfoot himself, who later became the New Testament critic. 
Mediumship, mesmerism, multiple personality, Plato society for psychical research, spiritualism, Sweden-born society, synthetic society, telepathy, transmedium, Westcott. I think Blavatsky's more spiritual than Westcott, man. All right, all tied to a cult. Marx is also tied to, no doubt, satanic uh, Satanism. There's a book by Richard Wormbrand himself called Marx and Satan. Now, Marx, he was no doubt messed up with sat so much of Satanism. I'm not saying that he applied membership for the Church of Satan and did human sacrifices. But there's no doubt that he shared that same spirit, uh, that same satanic spirit because of his elevation of Satan and how he treated it very lightly. There was no doubt he was demon possessed. This was before he created communism, okay? So he had this back then. So I would recommend that book, Marx and Satan by Richard Warmbrand. Richard Warmbrand, he's a respected Christian. Uh, he's a respected Christian that all, a lot of denominations adore because he was tortured by the Communist Party. All right? His famous book, Tortured for Christ, is still sold in the bookstore. But Warmbrand wrote a book on Marx and Satan. And he takes Marx's poems and his writings, and a lot of the writings have not been clearly revealed because the Communist Party restricted it for some weird reason. Why? I wonder why, right? Anyway, here's some of the writings that Wormbrandt was able to uncover. All right. Wallenem, okay? O-U-L-A-N-E-M. That's the drama that Marx was infatuated with. Okay, why is that important? Because that's, ba that's a backwards or anagram which Satanists get infatuated with, for Emmanuel, God with us. But Marx was involved with that. This is a confession by Marx in a poem called The Player, which was later downplayed by both himself and his followers. So this was before he did communism as well, but this is what he wrote back then. The hellish vapors rise and fill the brain till I go mad and my heart is utterly changed. See this sword? The prince of darkness sold it to me. Who is the prince of darkness, the Bible says? <laughs> Satan. For me he beats the time and gives the signs. Ever more boldly I play the dance of death. So that's, uh, yeah, that's from him himself. Okay. Let's see. This is on page nine, okay, of that work. Page nine of that work. Now, this is from, uh, this is very disturbing from his daughter, Eleanor, Marx's daughter, okay? Page 14. His daughter, Eleanor, says that Marx told her and her sisters many stories when they were children. The one she liked most was about a certain Hans Rockel. Quote, the telling of the story lasted months for months. Months and months. Because it was a long, long story and never finished. Hans Rockel was a witch who had a shop with toys and many debts. Though he was a witch, he was always in financial need. Therefore, he had to sell against his will all his beautiful things, piece after piece, to the devil. Some of these adventures were horrifying and made your hair stand on end. So, Wormbrandt writes, Is it normal for a father to tell his little children horrifying stories about selling one's dearest treasures to the devil? Robert Payne, in his book, Marx, also recounts this incident in great detail, as told by Eleanor, how unhappy Rockle, the magician, sold the toys with reluctance, holding on to them until the last moment. But since he had made a pact with the devil, there was no escaping. Marx's biographer continues, quote, There can be very little doubt that those inter... Uh, those interminable stories were autobiographical. He had the devil's view of the world and the devil's malignity. Sometimes he seemed to know that he was accomplishing works of evil. Now that's just a few, okay? You can read the whole thing. I don't have time to read the whole thing. That should be more than enough. All right, last big two. You ready for this? Last big two, and then we'll call it a night. This is interesting from Frederick Widowson. And he documents his history, all right? This is from a secular historical perspective. Page 336. Perhaps the most influential perpetrator of occult ideas at the end of the 19th century was known as Madame Blavatsky, author of The Secret Doctrine and Isis Unveiled, free online, in which she links Lucifer with Christ. 
She even makes passing reference to Bible translator Westcott. Wow, I didn't know. As being naive and ignorant of the connections he made between an apocryphal New Testament book that was excluded from the Bible and the Gospel of John apparently unaware of the occultic nature of the manuscripts of which he was enamored. This can be found in volume two of her work, Isis Unveiled, page 243. All right. Historical event, and you wonder why there was a revival of occult? It was a historical time period during that same time. You wonder why? You wonder why? There was an occultic revival of sorts among prominent religious people in the Anglican church in the late 1800s. Anglican? Anglican church won the world. What happened to England? Where did Westcott and Hoare come from? And they were downplaying Anglican and praising Newman when he switched from Anglican to Catholic. You remember that? That was that time period. I smell a rat, man. Uh, there was an occultic revival of sorts among prominent religious people in the Anglican church in the late 1800s as well as among other prominent people as I mentioned. She went on Blavatsky went on to influence such world movers in the 20th century as Adolf Hitler. And you wonder why Adolf Hitler got influenced by that. Oh, by the way, Kittel, who is a textual critic as well, was part of the Nazi party. I'll read that a little later on. And these groups influenced to where Hitler came to the scene too. I smell all of this sharing the same evil spirit. They all share the same evil spirit. No doubt about it. Hands down, man. The occult interest of many respected churchmen in the late 1800s is documented by James Webb in the book The Occult Underground. The ecumenical movement got an important start in the late 19th century as well with Philip Schaff, historian, liberal theologian, and Bible translator, American Standard Version, addressing the World Parliament of Religions in 1893, organized by Unitarians and held in Chicago, Chicago in connection with the Columbian Exhibition. Okay. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So notice right here that this new world order thing combined with Satanism and all this, they're, they're, they all come at the same time. Yeah. But it doesn't happen when the King James Bible comes out. You, you wonder that? Yeah. Who would support modern Bible versions after this? Good, By their fruits ye shall know them. Now, my last biggest documentation. Ready for this? Manly P. Hall. 33rd, I believe, 33rd degree Mason. He's the one that really knows the occult. This is found in his work, Manly P. Hall, Horizon, the magazine of useful and intelligent living, spring 1944. Monthly letter of November 1st, 1934. You know what he said? See if all this is connected to the Bible version issue. All right. For the last hundred years, we have been trying. Who's we? You know, the Manly P. Hall, the occultist, he's saying we have been trying for the last hundred years. We have been trying to get out an edition of the Bible that is reasonably correct, but nobody wants it. Why? Because of the Philadelphia church age. Everyone was getting revived by the King James Bible. That's the book. That's Amen. the only book they'll ever know. Amen. But nobody wants it. He whines. What's wanted, he complains, what's wanted is the good old King James Version, every jot and tittle of it, because most people are convinced that God dictated the Bible to King James in English. <laughs> Take that! Stupid James, why you call this a conspiracy theory? Dan Walnuts, John Anklebum, you, you critics, you. No, this is from Manly P. Hall himself. In fact, it has already shown its attitude in the matter by refusing a revised edition. For, for over 300 years, erroneous theological notions have been circulated deriving their authority from the King James Bible. You know what that means? He's saying this, the right beliefs and doctrines, the reason why these people believe what they do is because of that King James Bible. Yeah. You wonder why all these wrong beliefs came out? 
why the elites finally was able to take control through that group and come out, all this kind of stuff? Booyah! Post this online all over the world, all right? You don't know conspiracies, you thought. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. Made us see why Philadelphia became Laodicea. It connected to that book, Lord, because that book was stepped upon, criticized, critiqued. That's why everything came to pieces where the Catholicism with their new world order can take over through the Antichrist, as well as Satanism taking a control of people's souls. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.